All right, I am now joined by a very special guest. MLB pitcher Cody Sedlock joins the pod. Uh, Cody, thank you so much for hopping on here tonight. Uh, I've, I'm really looking forward to this one. I think it's going to be a really cool chat. Uh, first of all, how are you? How's the arm? Uh, how's everything? You know, I'm doing good. Um, had Tommy John about three weeks ago. It was kind of just a, a weird situation. Um, I, I tore it in 2019 to 75%, tore my UCL. But then my body did like a great job of developing a bunch of bone spurs to uh, protect my elbow. So I've been able to pitch up until now. And um, I actually pitched all off season. You know, did, my arm didn't feel right, but it didn't feel like completely healthy, you know. And then I started getting offers from teams because I was a free agent and uh, they were going through my medicals and looking at an old MRI I had. And they were like, yeah, you know, his arm's about to blow out. So. I don't want to, uh, you know, take the risk and they pulled, they were pulling back offers. So I went and, um, you know, got another MRI and, uh, yeah, your elbow is pretty beat up. So I, uh, you know, I got Tommy John. You, you mentioned pitching with bone spurs. How painful of that, how painful of a process was that trying to operate normally when you could feel that there's something wasn't right? Uh, I, it, I wouldn't say it like really hurt, you know, like, and, and the doctor was absolutely amazed by this you know, but I, um, you know, it would hurt at night. It would, you know, stuff like that. But like the big thing was just like the range of motion. Like my elbow was like locked out at here because I had big bone spurs in the, uh, you know, in my elbow protecting it. But, um, you know, after, after I got the surgery done, I, you know, I woke up, the doctor came in and he was like, his doctor did a great job and, um, came in and was like, you know, I, I think it's unbelievable that you were able to pitch with that elbow for so long. You know, we cleared so many things out. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's no doubt, and I don't tell guys this, but you're going to gain velocity from this. So I'm, I'm holding on to that. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, excited to come back. So what, what's your timeline timetable that you're working on? Um, when can you like start throwing again? And then when's like the next time you'll you're like, I'm assuming there'll be like showcases and having teams come out and look at, look at you. So, um, what, what's your timetable look like? So right now I can start like tossing at like 45 feet at six months. So I had it done on March 8th. So I don't know what that lines up to be, but I'm hoping to be ready to, you know, doing some like live ABs, maybe a couple innings at the end of spring training next year, probably showcase myself enough before spring training to show like, all right, you know, Cody's got a healthy elbow. He's coming back firing and, uh, you know, work up maybe like a month of, you know, a rehab assignment at the beginning of the season and then jump right back into, you know, triple A and then big leagues. So. Wow. So next, next year's a big year for you. I'll definitely be rooting for you. Um, um, so I want, I definitely wanted to take it back and talk a little bit about college. Cause I, I saw your post on Instagram, uh, talking about the good old days, um, back in yeah. Illinois. Um, I, I'm always curious though, at like the college level, like, <laughs> how like guys elevate their game throughout their time there. Like, you know, from the time you were a freshman to the time you were a junior, like what were kind of some of the things that you were focused on improving year to year back, back in the college days? I, I the, the big thing for me was like the weight room, you know, I, I, I got into, into college and um, I, you know, I, I had a little bit, you know, my, my junior and senior year of high school touched the weight room a little bit, but you know, those college workouts are a little different. And, um, that my, my freshman year, I, I was really a late bloomer, even in college, um, you know, my freshman year, I threw 30 innings, sophomore year through 30 innings. And then my junior year through like a hundred innings and was like the Friday night starter, you know? So it was like, uh, it was, you know, a late bloom, a lot of process that went into that. But, um, I'd say the big, the biggest thing for me that, you know, I gained from college was just those this consistent great workouts and just busting my ass every single time out. So when did you kind of establish like your pitching philosophy? Like when, when was kind of like that day when you're trying to figure out like how you're going to operate from, from college and I guess even onward, like when did you kind of like, were you always like a swing and miss guy? Like what was kind of like your philosophy back then? And has it evolved over time? Yeah. My, my philosophy has evolved majorly over time. And, uh, in college or in high school, I was, you know, mostly forcing fastball, curveball. And then my freshman, sophomore year, I started developing this like really good cutter. So I would basically be like cutter curveball. 
And then my junior year, I started throwing sinkers. So I was throwing sinker slider. And so I was just hammering sinker slider. And then I got to, uh, I got to pro ball and, um, like my first couple of years, like I remember I, I was listening to, I don't remember who, I think Grayson was talking about, you know, his first year with the old regime with the Orioles and, um, you know, how they told him that they need, he needed to throw like 75, 80% balls. And I'm like, yeah, that is the truest statement I have ever heard. <laughs> I remember, I remember my, my first year um, in Aberdeen and they were like, yeah, you need to throw 80% fastballs. And like my slider was my best pitch at that time. And, um, and I was like, I just like, I, I lost my slider, you know, just from throwing so many fastballs getting, you know, I, I had a, I had a good first year, but, um, and then after that, you know, Thrascella syndrome, all the injuries, my velo tanked, you know, I was throwing, you know, 87 miles per hour, 86, 87 miles per hour. So I had to learn how to get hitters out with that. So then I started developing my changeup to get hitters off my fastball. And then since then on my changeup has been by far my best pitch. So. That's fascinating here. And kind of like how you've had to kind of like reinvent yourself, not just one time, but several times. Uh, and I do remember that Grayson podcast. I think he was on a podcast talking about that. Um, I, I mean, so. I'd love to talk about the, the Orioles stuff uh, in a minute, but I, I was going back and I was looking at like some of like your, your college game logs. And I don't know if this is like a typo or I don't know if this is right or not. So I wanted you to kind of help me. It said you pitched 10 and two thirds against Ohio state and you threw 132 pitches. Does that, does that ring a bell? Yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> so that's, my last five starts. Yeah. yeah. My last five starts in college, I went um, 10 and two thirds innings, seven and two thirds, nine nine and two thirds nine innings my last five starts it was crazy it was crazy but like that Ohio State game I mean I no game in my entire career will ever match that I in, in, the, in the last pitch I, I went inside and uh because we we ended up winning in 15 innings one to nothing um and I remember going inside and checking the temperature and it was like 31 degrees too and i'm throwing 132 pitches but it, it was it was awesome i was pumping like 95 in the 11th it was sick <laughs> that's that just feels like like how was your arm after that or were you just built up to the point where it's like you could bang out 10 and two thirds on the rig yeah i mean this was this was like pre-injuries so i mean honestly that last inning i felt like i could go five more innings you know but the next day I was definitely sore in my back, my arm, everything, but, um, nothing, nothing, you know, more than, more than usual. That's just, that just blew my mind when I saw that, like from a conditioning perspective, do you think that it was just like being young at the time that like you were able to go out and throw that many innings? Cause I, you know, that's, I don't know how many years ago that was, but I'm assuming that's not a common practice anymore. At least I hope not. Yeah, I hope not too. But, um, I, I think at the time I, that was the longest uh, pitcher has gone in like all of college year or something. But, you know, back then, like the, all of the conditioning, all of the, like I said, like the weight room stuff was, you know, I was on the ball and it's different. It's, it's a lot different in pro ball because you're playing every single day, you know, in college, you're playing on the weekends, you know, one midweek game, maybe two, and you have all of that time, in the off season, everything to, you know, be as a team and, you know, get after it in the off season. It's just a little shorter season, you know, everything. But um, I think the conditioning and the weight room aspect played a big part and, you know, it was before the injuries, but that, yeah, you know, looking back, I, I'm, I'm happy I had that game because that was the, you know, by far the best game I will ever have in my entire life. But if, if it was my son or something doing it, I'd say, all right, take it easy. You know, yeah. let's, let's go into the dugout after nine, you know, that's, is that something you take a lot of pride in though? Like having the ability, maybe like, like, like a little bulldog mentality, like, Hey, I'm your guy. The ball's mine. I'm not giving the ball up and I'm just going to go out there and shove for, you know, however many innings I'm allowed. Does that, does that sound like something that, like, do you, do you have that kind of mentality? Oh, absolutely. Um, I remember, my uh before my junior year having all the pre-draft meetings and stuff you know the scouts are asking me like what what's your what's your game plan like what's your goal every single game out and and i every single one i told them straight up 
my my goal is when I start, I want to finish the game. You know, so I I'm trying to get get to nine innings and finish the game every single to every single time out. And I had that mentality. And um, truthfully, before before even with you know the injuries and playing hurt and everything, uh, before I felt my UCL you know tear in that one pitch in 2019. I, I still felt that I feel still felt that way, but then it was, it was weird. I should have known, you know, that that was why, but ever since then I would get to the third inning and I'd be like, man, I don't know why, but I am just, I, I'm, everything feels okay, but it just feels like I'm gassed, you know, like it's just, the ball is just not coming out, you know, but, but hopefully now that with a, with a brand new elbow and everything, we'll get back to that. So. Oh, no doubt. That ha- yeah, especially when you're going through the draft process. I'm sure that like that was music to some of these scouts and, and teams, people's ears. Like, yeah, I, I think teams value a guy like a, a starter who has that kind of mentality. Um, was there a moment when you knew that like you're cruising through Illinois, you're having these incredible games? Was there a moment that you knew a first round draft pick could be a possibility? Like, what, what was that like for you? Um, yeah, so I went to the Cape Cod League after my sophomore year, and I was a reliever my whole sophomore year. And we had an unbelievable team that sophomore year in college. Uh, we were like sixth in the nation, hosting a super regional against Vanderbilt. We ended up losing to Vanderbilt, but um, just an incredible season. Go to the Cape and the beginning, I'm like starting to interview agents and stuff. And uh, they're like, yeah, talking to scouts, we got you in the, you know, state round. Um, and then as the season progressed, I finally talked my because I was I was a reliever the first half of the Cape season. Finally talked my coach into starting me, and then I just absolutely went off the second half of the season. And I, uh, by the end of the season, um, all of the you know preseason mock drafts and stuff came out, and I was like sneaking in on the the late first round. But I think that the the big thing was after that Ohio State game for sure. I remember talking to my talk, talking to my agent and. Uh, or my advisor at the time. And uh, he was like, yeah, I was sitting, I was sitting, he was at the game and he was sitting next to a Miami Marlins scout. And after the eighth inning, I think, I think they had like, they must've like forfeited a first round pick or something. And they had an early second round picker. I don't know what it was, but they, uh, they told my agent, Hey, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to go to the hotel. Like he's not making it to us. Like I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to dip out. He's not going to make it to our pick. So then after that, I was like, all right. Like, I think, I think we're, we're good to go for the first round. Wow. It, when did the Orioles come into play? Like what were there, was there a lot of meetings beforehand? Did you kind of have an inkling of like where, or like if they would be the ones that would end up taking you? Yeah. So I knew, I knew no doubt if I fell to 27, that the Orioles were taking me. Um, they told me straight up before the draft that even if they had the fifth overall pick, that they would they would take me. Uh, and I remember, I, I Duquette. I don't know if it was Duquette or if it was you know the assistant GM or whatever. I remember Dan Durst, and he was the uh, the scout that signed me with the Orioles. I don't know who he's with now or what he's doing, but um, he texted me before I pitched at Maryland in College Park against Mike Schwarren. He was like. Hey, hey, you know, time to make some money. And then he sent a bunch of, then he sent a bunch of like money emojis. And I'm like, all right, I don't know what this is, but there must be some, some sort of high level of guys coming from the Orioles to come, you know, watch me. And I, I uh, ended up having a really good game. And uh, I think that was, that was the game where the Orioles, you know, liked me. That was such an interesting time too, in like Orioles, like history, like 2016, like they're in the middle of a playoff push. They were, you know, they, they, I think they had the most wins in the AL from 12 to 16. So it's like, this was an organization that was like trying to continue to build. Um, like when, when you, when you, how excited were you to, to join an organization like that, where it's like, they had this commitment to winning. You'd already seen it. Like the playoffs were there. Like you're, you're, you're going to an organization that like taking a college pitcher, you, you never know. Like that could have been like, there's a lot of upward mobility, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Like how, how exciting was that when they finally did call your name? Oh, it it was, it was very exciting. And, um, I, it it was, it was relieving and exciting because I I thought for sure the Astros were going to take me. Yeah. I think it was 17 or something. Um, flew me out to Houston, 
I was in the GM box with Elias because he was the uh, the assistant GM at the time, and uh, introduced me to Nolan Ryan, Craig Biggio. They're you know they're saying to me, you know, mm-hmm. are you ready to make this your home? Like everything, I thought for sure the Astros were going to take me. And then when the Astros took Forrest Whitley with their pick, I was like, what? Like I don't know what happened. But then um, then once you know, being a kid from like you know rural Midwestern town, I didn't have too much. You know, I, I didn't really watch the Orioles, you know, too much. I was more, you know, Cubs, Cardinals, White Sox. And um, but then once I got, you know, dig, dig deeper into it and then the history of it and everything, I, I was I was very, very excited, especially, you know, where they were at the time. They had, you know, a bad farm system and a really good major league team. What you know, that's a great situation to come into. Especially, yeah, like being somebody who had pitched at the collegiate level, who's a little bit older, a little more mature. Like, yeah, that that happens all the time. Like, I think the the Royals was that in fourteen they brought up like, what, like their first round draft pick to pitch in like the playoffs after they had just taken him like months earlier. Like, yeah, Kyle yeah, I, yeah. yes. I'm, I just want to give a little myself pat, a little pat on the back for remembering that. Um, but I mean, yeah, that that had to be such a, an awesome time for you. But I wanted to go back because we we touched on this a few minutes ago, where it was like the Duquette pitching philosophy. Um, or maybe lack thereof. Can you describe what it was like in the organization? You, you, you know, you, you talked about like they wanted you to throw more fastballs. What what was kind of like the analytics situation back then, and and how did that all kind of what did that look like uh, from a pitching perspective with a, a Dan Duquette regime? Um, so like going into it, I, I had I had no idea what to expect. You know, I uh, hadn't had I had some friends in pro ball. I didn't really you know know what what was going to happen, but I know that they, you know, at the time they had a lot of, you know, old veteran major league guys that were coaches and, you know, it seemed like a lot of them, they wanted to stick to their, you know, their roots and have you do exactly what they, you know, they came up doing. Um, So I remember my very first day down in Florida after I got drafted, I, I, in college, I would do bands, you know, bands to get my shoulders warmed up and some plyo balls, you know, to get my arm warmed up before I would play catch. And um, so that was my routine. So I walk out the very first day to play catch and I bring out my plyo balls and my bands. And they, they made me walk all the way back inside to put those back in my locker and never bring those back out again. I'm like, <laughs> why? And then they, they said something about, forearm tightness or something i i don't know what it was i was like man that's weird like but all right whatever you know like i'm gonna i'm gonna listen to these guys and uh and then i'm playing catch i'm getting ready for a start or whatever i get out to 90 feet i usually play long toss before i before i start you know getting on the mound and stuff i you know in college i would ramp it up to you know 280 feet or 270 feet or whatever just to get the arm warmed up and I remember I got to 90 feet. I started taking – this is an Aberdeen. I started taking some steps back, and I don't remember who it was, but they're like, Cody, come back in. You're not going past 90 feet playing catch. So I had to come back in. Not, I didn't, they didn't let me play long toss. They wouldn't let me – it was, it was, it was just a, a, a weird situation. You know, they, it, they, they, they obviously wanted the best for me, but – they were stuck to their stuck to their roots, you know? And um, it was one of those things where they were, they were from the second I got drafted, you know, they had a bad reputation with first round uh, arms, you know, with Dylan Bundy and Hunter Harvey getting hurt and stuff. So they tell me, they, they say, Hey, health is the number one importance with you like you have to stay healthy in bullpens we don't want you over 60 percent. we don't want you in pfps to throw more than just a flick in it over to first base everything so i listened to him and i was like okay like you know i'm gonna do whatever i can to stay healthy so i took my foot off the gas a little bit going 60 percent in bullpens playing catch 90 feet only and then trying to let rip in the game and then you know i swear what happened i got hurt you know so it uh it's just, it's just, it's just one of those things where I think nowadays more teams are getting into that more modern, you know, pitching philosophy. I know that I know for a fact, talking to some teammates who have gone to other organizations, there are some other organizations that are still, you know, caught in the, the early two thousands mode, 
but um i i do i do to be honest i do wish that once i when i got drafted that the pitching development that they have now you know was there i think that a lot of things would have changed wow i i had no idea like that's was that the kind of thing where like you and your fellow guys maybe in a bullpen like did did you have these conversations with your fellow arm mates your guys in the bullpen fellow pitchers like hey guys like is this does this sound kind of weird like were there internal conversations on the team about that kind of stuff yeah for sure um but but also like all of these guys this is their first taste in pro ball you know it's not like i was in triple a talking to a guy who's been in seven different organizations you know all of my teammates all of my friends they all got drafted with me they they knew nothing else you know so um we were just going into it into it blind and and that's not to say that like the old you know duquette regime didn't didn't have really good things because they, they did they treated their players very very well i i mean like just like with the logistics things like they really did care about the player as a human um you know like let's just say you're your grandma's sick. They're letting you go home for two weeks to, you know, be with your grandma. You know, they, 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 they separate life from baseball. And, um, but the, the pitching side of it was, was, was a little bit, a little bit different. Can you talk about like the difference when Elias came in in 19, that off season, like what were some of the first things that you noticed right off the bat? Like, Hey, this, there's some like positive change being done here. Yeah, the big thing was just every bullpen having cameras and track man. And um, I, you know, my first three years in pro ball, we didn't, we, we had track man, but it was more just like looking at spin rate and uh, stuff like that. Like we didn't really know what we were doing. So you show up to camp, um, there's track mans everywhere, there's cameras everywhere. And then we sit down and we have, meetings like every single morning going over what these numbers mean what what we want out of these numbers what we don't want um just like classroom sessions so that that and then along with um just like a modern mechanical standpoint on you know pitching when it you know chris holt talking you know doing different drills with plyo balls and you know mechanics and work on hip rotation and everything you know i uh I do want to tell this story and I, I've been wanting to tell this story on this, on the podcast, but um, so in 2017, I had two DL stents with my, my elbow, like a little, you know, flexor strain or something. So I was on the DL when I went into instructional league after 2017 and um, I, so I couldn't throw but I was just working out and doing rehab and stuff. And they, a, a certain coach had me on the mound every single day doing towel drills. And then all they would be doing was videotaping me, trying to get my arm higher. So like, if this is my natural slot, they were trying to get my elbow above your shoulder, which is not what you want, you know? So I'm sitting here trying to go like this, you know, trying to throw the ball with my, my you know elbow above my shoulder and everything and just in I have a hurt elbow at the time but I'm just doing towel drills so you know it's okay uh but I'm, I'm just hammering these towel drills so I just learned this this last off season when I um started working out at Trad Athletics in Charlotte and they went over all of my trackman numbers throughout the years and everything and they were like hey like what what happened between 2017 and 2018 that made your release height go from like six foot to six eight so I gained eight inches of release height. So I went from, you know, here to here. And, uh, and I was, I told him, I told him the, the towel drills and videoing me just trying to get my arm up as high as possible. And then what happened in 2018 was, you know, when you go from here to here, all of those nerves, you know, and arteries pinching your shoulder. And then I had thoracic syndrome. So I missed that, that entire year because my, my arm you know, it was my shoulder was just pinching every single throw. What, what was the rationale with the towel drills and trying to get your arm up higher? What, what did they tell you to like, Hey, we're going to try this. It will do what, like, what was that like? Uh, well, it was, it was because like, because my elbow was hurt, I was kind of babying it a little bit and my arm, my elbow was getting a little low. 
but I, that I mean that that really wasn't the the way to go about it, you know. Oh my god! But that's why. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I've heard you talk in other maybe like post games or other interviews, just like the all the injuries, like you said, seventeen and eighteen. There's a lot of them. Like, where did you kind of like draw strength from during those rough times? Honestly, my my wife at the time, or my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, um, you know, she gave me a lot a lot of strength. And honestly, I just dug dug deep into myself. You know, I uh, there were a lot a lot of really really down times you know tons of anxiety tons of everything you know you have the the weight of the world on your shoulders you know being a first round pick and then you just do not know why the ball is not coming out the way it should and why you keep getting hurt and all of these things and it uh you know it it definitely took a toll on me and um just trying to find a purpose outside of baseball you know that 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 really helped me and um you know, to any like young ball player who has like pressure or anything, you know, it's not, it's just a game, you know? And um, once I realized that and I started having fun again and um, just trying to be an athlete again and not take what I did at the park and bring it home and think about it all night long, then it kind of frees you up and then you can just have fun again. And then that's when the success comes. You know, there was, there were so many times in 2018 and 2017, even in the off season, where I would, you know, go and play catch and then I would, you know, video every little thing. And then I would like analyze my mechanics all night long, trying to figure out what is going on. Why am I throwing 87 miles per hour? You know what I mean? Why is my shoulder hurt like hell every single time I, you know, go down to sleep at night and stuff like that. But, um, I really just, you know, relied on myself and my family and, uh, and Bowie for sure. Do you think that going through that, all that adversity in those 17 and 18 years, do you think going through all that made you a better baseball player at the end of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Now it's one of those things where one bad day isn't going to turn into a bad week. You know, um, every, when I was, when I first got drafted and um, you know, I, everyone expected me to be in the big leagues in one year. So in my mind, my, you know, stupid young mind, I was thinking, all right, well, I'm looking forward to the big leagues, you know, like everything I'm doing, I'm just, Oh, I'm just going to prepare my, you know, get ready for the big leagues instead of knowing where my feet are and trying to become a better person and a better ball player every single day. You know, whether you're at, you're in low A, you're at, you know, 12, U travel balls, you're at whatever, you know, have those goals in mind, but know that it's not going to be a jump. It's going to be, you know, one step at a time. I, I wish I could go back and, um, you know, tell myself that for sure. Did you have, or maybe still do, like, do you have outlets where you're like able to get your mind off the game? Like, you know, how, how are you able to kind of like decompress after, you know, a, a day at the yard? Like what, what are you, some of the things that you do in that regard? Well, now I have a, uh, you know, I have a dog and a son, you know, he's, he's two years old and I get home and the last thing I want to think about is baseball, you know? So, so I have those outlets now where I get home and um, I learn, you know, I instantly, I walk in, my dog jumps on me, tank, golden retriever, and he jumps on me like, like I am, you know, God's gift to this earth, you know? And uh, that makes me feel good. And then I, you know, hang on my son and he doesn't care if I gave up seven runs in two innings that day, you know? So, um, that, that definitely, you know, harms me in and the, the, the big jump and the big, um, when I went from 2018 to 2019, when I, you know, 2019, I had a really good season. We picked up my, my, our dog tank, uh, on the way to spring training. And then honestly, ever since then. I have, I, I go home and I, you know, hang out with him and he just keeps my mind off of everything. We interrupt this episode to bring you a word from the official sponsor of Not For Long Media and the Breaking Bass podcast, the original Fudge Kitchen. It is a staple of the Jersey Shore with six locations in Cape May, Wildwood, North Wildwood, Stone Harbor, and Ocean City. The original Fudge Kitchen makes all of their fudge in-store guaranteeing a delicious product, so stop by and let them know that Not For Long Media and Breaking Bass sent you. Check them out online at fudgekitchenswithans.com as they are shipping fudge and sweet treats all across the country. Now back to the episode. 
I love that dude. That's the best. Yeah. Dogs are the best. I, yeah, I was looking at your, your baseball yeah. reference like year by year. There was that like 18 to 19 was a pretty significant, like yeah, your ERA, ERA went down. Like you cut it in half. You had this great season. Like what, what was kind of the difference? Was it, what is it as, as simple as like the Elias regime coming in? Like you're getting healthy. Like, was it just everything kind of game together at the right time for you to have that success? Uh, no, there was, there was a lot that went into it. Um, so in my first off season, 2016 and 2017, I was down in Champaign, just doing throwing on my own uh, at, co- at my college at University of Illinois with some buddies and uh, no eyes on me, no instruction. And then the next off season was kind of the same thing up in the Chicago area. And then that next off season, I'm like, I got to do something. So I, uh, my, one of my really good friends played with him since I was like 11 years old is uh, Eric Jagers. And he is the, uh, I think he's the bullpen coach. I don't know if he's a bullpen coach or assistant pitching coach um, right now with, uh, with the Mets. No, 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 he's a pitching coordinator now for the Mets. He was with the Reds last year as a bullpen coach, but now he's a pitching coordinator with the Mets. And um, at the time he was working at driveline in Seattle. So I hit him up and I was like, Hey, like, what do you got for me? Like, I need, I need to have a really good off season this year. And he's like, all right, we're going to set you up with a plan. He went through driveline. They uh, sent me a whole plyo ball routine. I was sending videos. They were, you know, telling me stuff to do. And that, that really, it really gave me the, the confidence, you know, knowing that I wasn't going into it blind, the confidence to go in there and, uh, and to have a good season. Yeah, no, absolutely. How, how did the 2020 season work for you? Obviously, I'm assuming you went to this, the big league spring training and then the season shuts down. What, how did you kind of stay busy and, and ready throughout the course of a, a pandemic, you know, cutoff season? Lots of throwing in the backyard. <laughs> That's for sure. I, uh, so our old house in, in uh, Johnsburg, Illinois, we, um, we had this, I don't know, this like wooden structure in our, in our backyard, and um, I had these gym mats from my, my home gym. And what I did was I, I, I screwed it into this wooden structure. And then I took spray paint and I spray painted a strike zone. And then I would, I would just sit there and chuck balls at that all day long for six days a week. And then on you know one day a week, I would go down to um, the Bow Dome. I think it's in Lockport, Illinois. Ryland Bannon tra- trains there, Sam Travis and uh, – I would go and I'd throw live, live ABs to them, you know, five inning live ABs inside. But, um, that's how, that's how I stayed ready. And I would just keep working out and everything. Wow. Yeah. No, everybody, everybody had to get creative that off season. Yeah. That's, or that season. That was, that's, that's fascinating to hear that. Um, yeah. So like, I think a thing that doesn't get talked about a lot in terms of like minor league baseball is just like the grind of it. And, and you know, you could talk this year in the system for, for all those years, but it's like, did you have to like make any hard choices like financially or lifestyle wise, um, you know, as like, you know, time went on. Um, not, I mean, not, not particularly. Um, I, I was, I was, I was, I was absolutely blessed enough to, to get the signing bonus that I, that I had to where I was able to play on that one quarter of poverty, you know, salary that we were, that we were on, you know, and I was grateful enough to, you know, see, you know, be able to feed myself and, you know, everyone well and, you know, have, you know, nice hotels when my girlfriend visited and everything where, you know, 90% of my teammates are, making peanut butter and jellies at the field to take home to eat for breakfast and lunch the next day, you know, but, um, there, there really weren't, weren't too many, you know, big decisions that, that I had to make, but, um, I don't know if, uh, I don't think that anyone really knows this, but it it really did struck, struck like a chord in my, in my heart, you know, seeing all of my teammates struggle like that. And I, I actually, I don't know if you, you saw the, um, the $185 million class action lawsuit against the, the oh, MLB yeah. with um, against, you know, for the, the wages. And I was actually the only active player who was a witness in that case. So I sat through a deposition, sat through everything and, uh, you know, really fought for my teammates. And um, it, 
truly did lead to, you know, what we're seeing today with the, uh, you know, the increase in pay, the union, all of that, and all of the back pay that's coming from, from that trial. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud of doing that for my teammates. Wow. I, yeah. I had no idea. I, like I did see that the other day, you're right. Where it's like the salaries have kind of doubled. I think, was it like a year ago teams were like now required to provide housing and meals for like every level of the minors. Was that kind of recently? Yeah, I think that was last year. That was last year. And that was a, that was a huge step last year. Last year was, I was so much better than years before. I, uh, I remember that, you know, every team is different. I know with the Orioles, they did a really great job with um, setting up housing for me and my family. I, uh, since I had, you know, a spouse and a child, I was able to have a one bedroom furnished apartment, you know, all to ourselves for free. And then I went over to the Detroit Tigers, got traded over there and they, they straight up told me, Hey, since you have a child, you're not eligible for the housing. So I'm like, what? No, like, yeah. Like if you have a spouse, it's okay. You can, you, you'll get the housing paid for, but since you have a child, you have to pay for your own housing. And then they offered me to, to um, live in a two bedroom with another teammate, with my, my wife and son. But then if I did that, I also still had to pay $1,500 a month. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know how that, how that, made any sense but um so every team's different in that aspect but i'm hoping with with the union and uh, everything that everything gets uniform throughout the entire you know minor leagues yeah like that's you're right that i, I hope that's not like a a majority of teams do that I hope hopefully it's just like an isolated tigers thing even still that's not that's not great yeah i, I don't want to share sure. a house with another guy like if i don't have like yeah. i don't have to right well and, and, and that's fine like if if it's of free housing and especially when we're you know really working hard to try to get to the big leagues and we understand that we're not going to make very much money doing it it's okay to live with a roommate you know but the fact that i would have to pay also when you know all of my teammates who don't have you know a wife and kids has doesn't have to pay then that that was that was the issue damn yeah again this these are things that like i don't know if a lot of people know that side of the game but it's like fascinating to hear that like yeah the, there's the the unglamorous sides of of minor league baseball and trying to get you know ultimately to the big leagues which you did because i would like to talk about that too which is like 2022 they called you up to the orioles um how did you find out about that and who was the first person you called so i remember i it was, it was like a wednesday or something and i was supposed to I was supposed to pitch and um, in Norfolk and uh, it got rained out and they were like, Hey, you're going to pitch the second game of the double header tomorrow. And I was like, hmm, okay. And then I thought, I looked at the Orioles schedule and I saw they had a double header on Saturday and I'm like, all right, come on, please. <laughs> like that would be, this would be the perfect situation. I don't care. I'll be the 27th man, you know, just get me up there. And then on the Thursday, uh, Buck Britton called me in. He's like, Hey, I wish I could tell you that you're getting called up to the big leagues, but you're going up on taxi squad. I don't know if you're going to get activated or not, um, but you're going to Boston. And I was like, all right, I've had like, there's like five teammates before me that season that buck told them the same exact thing. You know, you're going on taxi squad. I don't know if you're going to get activated and every single one of them got activated. So I'm like, all right, so this is, you know, this is happening. And, um, and then I walked out, walked out of the stadium hugged my wife and son and then and, and told them, you know, yeah, like we're going, we're going to Boston. And uh, so got down there. Um, and then I was just rolling out before the game when I was still on taxi squad and Brandon Hyde came out to me, came up to me and was like, Hey Cody, you know, we're going to activate you. We're going to put you on the roster. You know, you're going to be, you know, hot in the bullpen today. And then, you know, the rest is, the rest is history. Wow. Yeah, no. Yeah. The, the one outing there in Boston, what, like, we, we, we talked it throughout this conversation about like your journey to get there. Like there's a lot of adversity you had to overcome. Like how special was it just like taking the mound in Fenway park for your major league debut? I mean, that had to be like an out of body experience. Yeah, it was, it was, it was incredible. I mean, uh, it was Memorial day weekend. So the place was just absolutely packed. I, uh, you know, I went and saw a Red Sox game when I was playing in the Cape with my, uh, with my sister, her husband, and then, you know, their kids when they came and visited me. And for some reason I had some, some weird like connection with Fenway park where uh, it was, it was just my favorite, my favorite ballpark, you know, forever. 
and uh, even more than Wrigley. And I grew up a huge, a huge Cubs fan. And uh, to, to have that happen at Fenway Park and to be able to go into the Green Monster and sign my name and uh, just hearing, you know, Sweet Caroline and the, the stadium just shaking. It was it was an unbelievable experience. And even though, you know, I only got one outing up there, you know, before it was all said and done. It was it was incredible, and I couldn't I couldn't have asked for anything better besides maybe a little bit better pitching line. But yeah, no, I mean that's still like you could say like you know at the end of the day like from first round draft pick you you know you did get called to the big leagues like you know it, it did take a, it did take some time but like what advice would you give to people who are grinding it out trying to get a break like you did like I'm assuming there were times where maybe like you had to question whether or not like you had the you know the, the will to keep going. So what what would you say to people who are still grinding it out? Just one more day, you know, there's been, there's been so many times in my career where, where I've gone into it and it's been like, you know what, like if I'm done, I'm okay with it, you know? And then I think to myself, all right, just give me, just give me one more day. And then one more day turns into 10 more days and then 10 more days turns into a year. And then if you put in that work, then you are, you know, three steps ahead of where, where you were, you know, previously. And I remember, I remember vividly um, this past season, I, I would write in a journal every single day, like at the ballpark. And uh, I was actually looking back on it the other day. And I think like two weeks before I got called up, I like wrote in there and I'm like, man, this is the most down I've been in, you know, a year. This is, I'm not throwing the ball well, I'm, you know, mentally just not not doing well. I'm, uh, you know, everything. I'm basically down bad. And then I just thought, you know, take it one more day, show up to the bar the next day, you know, great outing next time out, great outing next time out, great outing, boom, called up in the big leagues. I mean, things can happen so quickly. I like that. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Things can turn just like, yeah, one more day. I like that a lot actually. Um, well that's, yeah. I mean, I had a couple last, last things for you. Um, our guy Ryan Ripkin's not on here with us today, but I'm assuming you know throughout the, the years in the Orioles system, it, do you have like a favorite interaction, you know, memory of of hanging out with Ryan that stands out? I mean, there's so many that I can't even. I, it's just like to see to see him go into the business that he's going into. It's like, our right, thank goodness that you are doing that because you are made for it. I mean, that guy. He could he could tell a story to a brick wall and the brick wall would be interested, you know. Like he he's he he's a great a great talker, a great storyteller, and just overall just like an incredible human. And um, the most the most humble, the most caring you know person ever. And uh, my wife and I love him. They love you know Jamie. You know his uh, his you know I don't know are they are they engaged? I think no, I think his girlfriend. At the time, I, I, don't know. Friend. I, don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, so many people to keep up with, but, uh, but no, he, he, he's great. He's great. Yeah. I, I can't remember who told me this, but like, they would say that like, Ryan's always the guy that's like, he's like the glue guys, like trying to keep everybody together, like trying to organize, like, you know, try to keep the, try to keep the, the boys and the crew together. So I think, I, I think that's definitely somebody you want to have on, on in your corner is like a, a guy like Ryan, who's yeah. Like you said, just like, one of the nicest people ever and who's probably going out of his way to do nice things for other people too. So that's, he had to be a, a, just a pleasure to play with. Absolutely. Yeah. He, uh, he, he, he's a fantastic human. He'll, he'll like this part of the podcast, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> all right. So <laughs> a, a couple last, last things for you. Um, so, you know, 2022 Orioles, you caught a glimpse of it, but yeah. obviously they had so much success there at the end of the season. Like, could you tell even like being in the minors and, and being, you know, could you see the incremental growth and could you, you know, predict that they would be, have the success that they had in 2022 from being in it and around it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in Bowie in 2021, you know, all, all these young guys are coming up, you know, Adley, Stop, Hours, you know, they're, Ortiz, like they're, they're, they're all up there, Grayson got up there. And it's just like, where are these, these guys coming from? You know, I, it, it's, it's like, oh, like this guy's 22 years old. Like he, he'll, he'll have a learning curve in double A, you know, and they come up and it's just absolutely mashing, you know, 
So uh, I, I, I definitely saw it from a distance. I'd say it probably started in, in 2021 once that, that 2019 draft class and then the 2020 draft class started getting going. But uh, they have drafted fantastic since they, they came in. And, um, and I, I think that they have a really, really good base to win a lot of games here in the future. Did Adley give you one of his signature hugs? No. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I I, pay, I, I remember uh, when I got caught up to Boston or got caught up to the big leagues and uh, Adley was there. Man, he was acting like he was more excited for me than I was. You know, he was he was giving me a hug every every you know, 30 seconds. It was it was great. He uh, he he's a fantastic human and. and best ball player I've ever, I've ever played with. That's for, that's for damn sure. Um, but no, they, uh, I love, I love, I love Adley hugs. That's for sure. <laughs> I feel like guys like feed off that. Like, I feel like just, he's like the ultimate good vibes guy around the clubhouse. Like I feel like regardless of what mood you're in, going to the park that day, hanging out with him. And then obviously, you know, getting a, a great bear hug at the end of a game from him. Like that's, I, I feel like you can't beat that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, there's, there's some guys who take, you know, take every day, super, super seriously, like, uh, like Jordan Westberg, like he, he is a, a very serious human, you know, and he absolutely rakes, but, uh, Adley's the type of guy where you could be in the middle of the game and it's like a tie ball game in the eighth and you just like start talking to him and you could talk about anything, like something outside of the game that happened three nights ago. And he's just like hanging out. It's, uh. It, it just comes, it comes very, very natural to him. And uh, he doesn't take it too seriously. And I think that that's, what's going to, you know, help him keep his head for, for a very, very long time immense or un, while going, you know, under immense amount of pressure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, I, I, you know, I consider Orioles fans like myself to be very, very lucky that we have him on our team. Cause it's just like, you can just see the sky's the limit with him. It's, it's the best thing. Um, last, last thing. What, like, who are some of the guys that you remain close to? Like, who are some of you, like your, your best friends that like you, you've taken away from your time in the Orioles system was I'm imagining that there's some characters in there. Yeah. Are you saying like that are still playing or that just in general that I've. It could be in general. Yeah. I mean, general. you're in the system for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say the, the people I talk most to are uh, Ryan Mosley. And uh, that's, that's one that, only true Orioles fans will remember. I think he was seventh round pick in 2016 in my draft. And he got traded to the Dodgers our first off season, but we were like, we were tied at the hip our first year. And uh, we've kept in touch since I went to his wedding this past off season and everything. So talk to him a lot. Uh, Cameron Bishop talked to him a whole lot. Matthias Dietz, he's he, he's one of my one of my boys. He's a, he's a goofy character. He's a, he's a great great dude. Talked to him quite a bit. Um, other than that, talked to Vespi quite a bit. Uh, talked to DL, but other than that, just a whole a whole bunch of great guys. Yeah. No. Is it is as a pitcher like you know as a starting pitcher too? It's like imagine you have all that time in the dugout too. Was it was it easier on like the off days to just like you're around the guys. Is that, is that an easier way to, you know, strike up conversation and make a friendship out of that? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. Being a starting, well, I guess it goes both ways with being a starter and a bullpen arm because I, I did a little bit of both last year. And uh, as a starter, you get to talk to the other starters and the position players in the dugout, but as a bullpen guy, they like build that, that bond with your other bullpen guys and your bullpen catchers out in the bullpen, because that that's a free for all out there. I mean, there are no coaches <laughs> it, who knows what you're talking about out there. It could be, you could be talking about something way out in left field. And then they say, all right, you know, get said lock hot. And then you got to mentally <laughs> lock in and go right back in. But uh, I'd say the bullpen combos are a little more fun than the dugout combos, but uh, both, both are good. Both are good. Okay, I'll end with this one. Who is the funniest teammate you've had of all time? This is I wanted to I wanted to distill all the years and all the teammates. Can you give me one? Okay, I gotta think about this for a sec. Funniest, as in as in like like he he's just gonna make you laugh no matter what. Naturally, yeah, no matter what. All right, <laughs> probably Brennan Hanafy. 
Brandon Hanfee. I don't know if you remember. He, he was a 2016 draft. Uh, he he got uh, he signed with the Tigers. Actually, he's in AAA with, with Toledo with the Tigers this right now. Had Tommy John, but my God, that guy is the wittiest person I have ever met. Like he he'll crack it. He'll you'll say something, and he'll crack a joke the the best joke that you've ever heard. Like just super witty like that. And sitting uh, the only like I I played with him because we, we got drafted together, but he was a high school guy. So I got to spend my instructs with him. And then the first couple of weeks in Bowie in 2021 and then uh, in 2019 in Frederick, but he, he's one of the, he's one of the funniest. And he has a thick Southern drawl and like, it's just, <laughs> he, he, he's a character. He's funny. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that, that, yeah. The thick Southern draw, I'm sure adds to the overall, just like, yeah, character funniness of it, but yeah, that's yeah. that's incredible. That's dude. This has been this has been so great. Thank you so much for hopping on here tonight. Uh, you know, we're we're definitely rooting for you here as you're making your recovery from TJ there. Um, but yeah, I will have to get we'll have to get you back on the pod again with Ryan sometime. I'd love to hear some of those stories for that sure. that maybe you can get him to say that maybe I can't get him to say. Maybe we can coax it out of him with you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I Sounds it. great. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure some some tequila will probably be involved in that. So he, he does he does <laughs> enjoy glass. And I'm sure, yeah, yeah it, the stories will be endless. I love it. <laughs>